if you'll turn with me in God's word to the letter of First Peter. The letter of First Peter this morning will continue our study of this letter. We'll be looking at verses three through five. If you don't have a copy of God's word with you, um, you can find this on page 702 in the Pew Bible in front of you. And as you find your place, if you'll stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. This is what the Word of the Lord says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Father, may your spirit accompany the preaching of your word, grant repentance and new birth to those who are here who have never trusted in Christ, and we pray these things in Christ's name, amen. In perhaps his most famous and most widely read work of nonfiction, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote the following, hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. We are meant to look to another world. And C.S. Lewis says the reason why we're so ineffective in this world is because we've forgotten that our hope is in another one. In a 2018 State of Theology survey, when responding to the statement, God will always reward true faith with material blessings in this life, 35% of professing Christians agreed Only 54% disagreed to the statement there will be a time when Jesus Christ returns to judge all the people who have lived. Only 63% of professing Christians agreed. There are probably various reasons for these survey results, but I think a major reason why 35% of professing Christians believe that God blesses faith with material blessings now and only 63% of professing Christians believe Jesus is coming back again, is because of misplaced hope. We're hoping in the wrong things. Have you thought about heaven much in the past week? Have you given thought to the Lord's return last week? Probably not. Or if you have, probably not as much as you ought to. We're far too busy, far too distracted to think on such things. We've got bills to pay. We've got deadlines to meet. We've got practices to get to. On top of that, we've got to check on our Facebook notifications. We've got to keep up with the latest episode. We've got to stay current with the news. Now, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with any of these things in themselves, and life, of course, gets busy, but the point is this. In what are you hoping? 
We use that word hope in a lot of different ways. I hope it doesn't rain. I hope my team wins. I hope it isn't cancer. But when the Bible uses that word hope, it's talking about a certainty. It's used as a synonym for trust or or confidence. Pastor Sam Storms, he says, hope is full assurance, not uncertain desire. Hope is unshakable confidence that what God has said he will do, he will do. It is the full assurance or strong confidence that God will do good to us in the future as he fulfills his every promise. It's the difference between the uncertain hope of the world, I hope it doesn't rain, or I hope this year the Cubs will win, and the certain hope that God has promised good and I will have confidence in it because it is sure. So again, I ask, what are you hoping in? Money? Grades? A scholarship? Promotion? All of these are things in which people have misplaced hope. They're so uncertain. You may hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, but it might. You might hope for that promotion, but you might not get it. What we need is to remember the sure hope we have in Christ. Our future is certain because of him. The Christians in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, as we saw last week, are under pressure from society to to compromise their faith. They're in this hostile world with an uncertain future. In verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Peter reminds them of who they are. They are elect exiles. They are strangers. They are foreigners in this world. But in verses 3 and following, he goes in a different direction that you might have expected. After reminding them of who they are in this dark world that's full of trials and hardships and persecution and suffering, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed, that that word blessed, it's used two different ways in the Bible. In the first sense, it could be the blessing upon a human. So Jacob blesses his sons, or God blesses Abraham. It's promising good to them. That's essentially what that word blessing means. It it means good word. They speak a good word over people, promising good things in the future for them. But the second way in which it can be used is of people blessing God. Now, God doesn't need anything, and so we don't bless God in the same way that he blesses us. We're not blessing good things for him in the future. What we're doing when we say blessed be God is we're declaring God to be the one truly blessed one. The NIV, I I think, captures this when it translates that word blessed in verse 3 as praise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we find this is how it's used throughout the Bible. 1 Samuel 25, 32, David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Or 1 Kings 1, 48, the king also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. Psalm 106, verse 48 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say amen. Praise the Lord. This is how this phrase, blessed be the Lord, is used in the scriptures. Praise the Lord. Which is what makes it such an interesting turn of of subject for Peter. Because if you've ever gone through difficulties, if you've ever gone through persecution even... You probably didn't immediately think, praise the Lord. And yet this is what Peter starts off with. He starts off with praise. 
And the reason why he praises God in these verses is because of hope. He praises God, he blesses God because God has given to his persecuted, weak, small, afraid people hope. And it's not a hope that is uncertain. It's a hope that is sure. It's a hope that is secure. And it's a hope that not only do these saints need, it's a hope that you need as well. So we're going to look at this passage broken into two places, and we're going to see two things. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of this hope. And it is a hope that originates with God. It's a hope that originates with God. And it is also a hope that is secured by God. Let's look again at our passage in front of us as we see that this is a hope that originates with God. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In verse 2, Peter's prayer for the saints at the end of verse 2 is, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. May grace be multiplied to you. And in verse 3, he reminds them of that grace. He says, blessed be God because according to his great mercy, that word that is translated as mercy in the New Testament, it's translated in the Old Testament as steadfast love. The steadfast love, it's, it has this connotation of covenant faithfulness. So in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, the Lord, Yahweh, he passes before Moses and he proclaims his glory. And in his glory, he proclaims this, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This covenant faithfulness. Psalm 118 verse 1 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. This is his covenant faithfulness. God has made promises and we can be sure that he's going to keep his promises because he is a covenant faithful God. He is a promise keeping God. How is that mercy, how is that steadfast love, that covenant faithfulness, how is it demonstrated? Well, Peter says, according to his great mercy, according to the steadfast love, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To be born again, it reminds us of John chapter 3, Verses 1 through 10, as Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and he says, Teacher, we know you're from God, because no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus just cuts through all of the pretensions, he cuts through all the showiness, and he answers Nicodemus, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a necessity. You must be born again. If we must be born again, it must mean that we are in some way dead. And that's exactly what the scriptures say. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked we might think of Ezekiel chapter 36 and the valley of dry bones that represents dead Israel 
in sin and exile, separated from God. Their bones are very dry until the Lord says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones and say, stand up. May the breath of God enter into these bones. And what happens? The, the, these dead bones, they come to life through the preaching of God's word. And we are in need of this. This is a requirement for you to even see the kingdom of God. We were in need of something more than simply moral or social reform. We don't need just our environment to be changed. We, we don't simply need our behavior to be changed. We don't need something that, that a good psychiatrist can help us in our path to, to improvement. That's not what we need. We were in need of something supernatural. We need the new birth. And praise be to God. This is what Peter is saying. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has done this. He has caused us to be born again. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, even as... As Paul said, we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. He goes on and says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. Here's our miserable condition. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. We were walking according to the prince of the power of the air. We were walking according to the pattern of this world. We were being like a crumpled dead leaf, just being blown around. Wherever the winds of culture, wherever the society told us to go, that was our sinful, separated from God condition until praise be to God, according to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again. This is not something that God had to do. Looking upon our miserable condition, looking upon our sinfulness that, that we were fully responsible for, and yet we see God's merciful response. And notice in 1 Peter, notice who the agent is of this new birth. According to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again. I think we've been so conditioned to think that if you'll walk the aisle at youth camp or you'll recite some pre-written prayer, then you'll be born again. But that's not what the scripture says. He says, according to God's great mercy, this undeserved, steadfast love, he God has caused us to be born again. Nicodemus, he didn't understand what Jesus was saying. Jesus says, unless a man is born again, you, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and, and be born? Jesus, he's... He says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless God does something for you, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. It's not up to you to walk that aisle or say that prayer or sign that card or, or even be baptized. Those are not the instruments by which you are born again. Jesus says, the wind blows wherever it will. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. That's what it's like to be born again. This, this is not something that, that we just drum up. It's not as if we can just make this conscious decision one day. I, I think I'll be born again. We didn't cause our physical birth. And yet for some reason, because of human pride and arrogance, we think that we can cause ourselves to be spiritually born again. The futility of that is laughable. We don't cause ourselves to be physically born. We didn't say in, in some mysterious void, you know, I think I want to be conceived today. 
And, you know, it's been about nine months. I, I think I'll be born today. We didn't do that. that. That's absurd. And yet, for some reason, we think that it's up to our human decision. It's up to our own will that, that causes us to be born again. That's not what the scripture says. We don't cause it. All praise belongs to God. Our response of trusting in Christ is due to God's initial action. God is the instigator. We respond to God's graciousness. Or as theologians have said, regeneration precedes faith. Or as 1 John says, we love because he first loved us. Praise be to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because according to his great mercy, while you were dead in your sins and trespasses, while you were completely helpless, while you were cut off from all the promises of God, while you were in fact an enemy of God, he's caused you to be born again. That ought to cause us to worship. That ought to cause us to respond just like Peter is here in verse 3. Blessed, praise be to God. He's caused us to be born again. And he's caused us to be born again to a living hope. It's the opposite of the world's hope. You might think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, where the apostle tells the Christians that we're not to grieve as others do who have no hope. This isn't that kind of hope. What we're saved to is a living hope. Don't skip over that adjective. It's describing what kind of hope we're supposed to have. Not a dead hope, not a useless hope, not a, not a, a hope that this may happen, but this is a certain living hope. And we have a living hope because we have a living Savior. Why do we have a living hope? We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the reason why our hope is sure because Jesus has died and Jesus has been raised and Jesus is reigning and all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Christ. And so because we have a living Savior, we who are in Christ have a living hope. We can be sure because Jesus is reigning. We can be sure that God will keep all of his promises to those of us who are entrusting Christ with our salvation. Because of Christ, we have a living hope. And I think now, many of us get bored with thinking about Christ's death and resurrection. And we don't connect it with the hope that we're supposed to have in this world. Especially if you've grown up in church, you've grown up hearing the same thing. Jesus died and Jesus rose from the grave. And we just kind of repeat it in kind of this rote repetition. This is meant to be practical in your life. Not only is this supposed to cause us to respond in praise and thanksgiving for what God has done for us, this is meant to affect how we live every single day of our lives. Jesus is alive. And if I took a picture of your faces right now, I don't know if you'd believe it. Jesus is alive. And because he lives those of you who are trusting in Christ, you too will live. And because of all of these promises, we can be sure that we have hope. We have hope. Because of Christ, those of us who are in Christ can live lives of joy joy and peace and security and confidence and hope in this world. D. 
Do you have this kind of hope? Are you sitting here still thinking, well, I, I, you know, I, I just try to live a good life. I go to church. I give offering. You may be even a super Christian. Every time the doors are open, even a crack, you're there. You read your Bible, you pray, you just, you're a good person. You don't lie and cheat and steal. And you just hope that the good will outweigh the bad. That's not the kind of hope that the scriptures are promising. That's an uncertain hope. That's not a hope in Christ, that's a hope in you. And it's uncertain because you don't know how you're going to feel when you wake up in the morning. Our hope is not in us trying to be good enough. Our, our hope is not in feeling saved. Our hope is outside of ourselves. Our hope is in Christ alone. And if your hope isn't in Christ, then... No matter how you feel, you don't have hope. The hope that Christians experience, it's a hope in a Savior who lived a perfect life and fulfilled all the demands of God's law and then suffered the penalty of the curse in your place. And as he hung on the cross, all the, the sin, all the the condemnation, all the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. He died the death that you owe. And three days later, he rose again from the grave. And he ever lives to intercede for his people. That's the hope that Christians have. And if you've never trusted in Christ, trust in him today. Trust in him now. Don't wait. Why would you wait to take hold of this hope? Why would you wait till tomorrow to be certain that you have a future? Do it today. Trust in Christ and Christian, don't let go of this hope. Because Christ has died and has been raised, because Christ has ascended, because Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and is interceding for you, the writer to Hebrews says, we have this hope like a sure and steadfast anchor. We have an anchor for the soul. And no matter what the, the culture does, no matter how society throws all these trials and persecutions at you, you're not going to move because you have an anchor. It's grounded because of Christ. Can you see how this would help Christians in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia? Can you see how, how despite the emperor worship, despite having their property confiscated, despite having friends and family being thrown in the prison, despite the threat of death being thrown to the, the lions, being dipped in tar and put on a, a, a stick and being set on fire, do you see how this, this hope it's not optional. You need this hope. And you can have this hope. Trust in Christ. But this is a hope that originates with God. God does it all. God does it all for you. He does it all for the praise of his glorious grace. But it's also a hope that is secured by God. It originates with God, but it's also secured by God. 
Look at verses 4 and 5. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. God in his mercy has caused us to be born again. That's, that's where our hope originates. But now we have a hope that is secured by God. It's a hope that in the future we're saved to an inheritance. You know what an inheritance is, right? Something that children receive as their parents pass away. It's not something that they earn. It's a gift. It often refers to possessions, but really as it's, as it's at its core, the inheritance is you get the house, right? Everything else is in the house. You get the house. This is your inheritance. In the Old Testament, Israel was promised an inheritance. That inheritance could come from parents in the form of possessions, but at its very core, it's the promised land. They're given an inheritance. They're given the land of promise, this land that God gave to Abraham as an inheritance, to, to Isaac and Jacob, to the 12 tribes. As you look at the book of Joshua, they enter into their inheritance. They cast lots to divide the inheritance among the sons of Abraham. This is what the inheritance was. But now the New Testament picks up on this language, this Old Testament language of the inheritance, and it points to the reality of these promises. The promised land was pointing forward to a greater reality that's realized in the Gospels. I think too many times Christians... They're looking for these promises to be fulfilled in this little strip of land by the Mediterranean Sea when the New Testament says your inheritance is so much greater. It's so much greater than simply a strip of land. All the promises to which the promised land we're pointing are realized in the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 1. In him. In who? In Christ. In Christ we have obtained an inheritance. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. How has he qualified you? Through the death and resurrection of Christ and because you've been born again. You who are in Christ are qualified to share in the inheritance. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, says, therefore, he, again referring to Christ, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. This is the good news for all you who are trusting in Christ. You have an inheritance. Your parents may be dirt poor. You may be dirt poor. If you are trusting in Christ, you have a glorious, eternal inheritance. This is the hope that we have. We have a hope that is to an inheritance. And notice what kind of inheritance this is in verse 4. It's an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It's imperishable. It has no expiration date, right? You keep the milk in the refrigerator too long, and eventually you're pouring out curds, right? You've got cottage cheese for your cereal, because the expiration date, it has perished. Not so with your inheritance. 
It has no expiration date. It will not perish. It's undefiled. It remains pure. It remains good. It's unfading. It stays whole. You'll get all of it. You don't have to worry that time or weather or accidents will cause some of your inheritance to to disappear. It is imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. It's kept in heaven for you. This is the inheritance of the saints. This is, this is what kind of inheritance is waiting for you. And this is what we ought to be pursuing. This is what we're aiming for. But I'm afraid that many of us are aiming for things that are much worthless. That they are things that are perishable. We're, we're pursuing things that are defiled. We're pursuing things that will fade away. Jesus warned against this, right? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Don't try to keep up with your neighbor. Don't try to, to amass all of this wealth here. Your clothes and your electronics pastors and their books, I'm speaking to myself now, our stuff, our games, our cars, even our house, don't lay up treasures on earth because what happens to them? Moths eat it. Mice eat it. Dogs eat it. Rust, it corrupts it, it fades away. But, Jesus says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. It's kept imperishable, undefiled, unfading for you. Life may be hard. Persecution and trials will come. Our inheritance is waiting for us. But maybe you think, that's all well and good. I believe what it says. There's an inheritance for Christians that's kept imperishable and undefiled and unfading. But I'll never make it. I'll never see that inheritance. I've sinned too much. I think we can get some encouragement from remembering again the author of this letter. Because maybe you feel like Peter. Remember Peter. Before the rooster crows three times, you'll have denied me three times. Maybe you, like Peter, you've caved under pressure. Maybe the threat of persecution has arrived and you have just kind of slinked away. Camouflage, Christian. The good news that we find here in these verses is not only does God keep this inheritance in heaven waiting for Christians, but we're told in verse 4 and 5 that God also keeps you. He, he keeps this inheritance. It's kept in heaven for you at the end of verse 4, but verse 5 tells us 
that God also keeps you who by God's power are being guarded through faith. Who's guarding you? God. How much power is needed to guard your soul? Much more than you have. If you're hoping that I'll make it and that I'll, I'll, I will not fall away because I'm trying my hardest and I'm holding on as tight as I can, you are not strong enough. But God is. And God is the one who is guarding you. You are kept in his hands. As we sang earlier, your sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Martin Luther <laughs> always said things in such a brash way. <laughs> in such an unforgettable way. Because he said, if you're going to sin, sin boldly. By that, he didn't mean go out and just do whatever you want. He meant exactly what the scriptures say. If you're going to sin, sin boldly because God's mercy is stronger than your sin. There is no sin that is too terrible. You have not committed such an atrocious act that God's mercy and his grace in Christ Jesus can't wash it away. God is guarding us. But how are you guarded? Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. Here's where God's sovereignty and your responsibility meet. God is the one who guards you, but you must persevere. God doesn't run the race for you. You run the race, but you are guarded. And you're guarded through faith. But where does this faith come from? Do you produce it? Is it your responsibility that you got to dig down deep inside of you and, and pull up as much faith as you can, like pulling up water from a well? Well, praise God, no. Just like the new birth, the scriptures say that faith is a gift from God. And if it's a gift from God, you can be sure that God will give you all that you need to persevere. He guards you by his power through faith. And what's the end result? For you who by God's power are being guarded through faith, you are being guarded for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Praise God. Praise God. He has shown us mercy in the past. He has caused us to be born again. And he will continue to show you mercy. He will guard you and he will preserve you until Christ comes. He will preserve you until you obtain your inheritance. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, he said, In him we have obtained an inheritance... He goes on in verses 14 and 18. He says that the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And he prays for the church that we might have the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Remember, this is, as we saw in verse 2 last week, a triune salvation. The Trinity is working in unity to save you. 
And so God has called you and Christ has died for you and the Spirit is a seal in you guarding you and preserving you until the last day. So Paul can write in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, I am sure of this. This is not something that he's 99% sure. He is 100% sure. He is confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, the one who originated this salvation, the one who this hope originates from, the one who began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Not he might, not if everything goes according to plan, not if you keep up your end of the bargain, the one who began a good work in you, the one who sovereignly caused you to be born again to a living hope, he will bring it to completion. Praise God. Saints, praise the Lord. He has shown you mercy. This is what the Baptist faith and message says. All true believers endure to the end. We could stop there, couldn't we? All true believers will endure to the end. But it goes on. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by his spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair their graces and comforts and bring reproach on the cause of Christ and temporal judgments on themselves. You may sin. You will sin. You will do grievous things. You will violate the law of God. You, you will read your Bible and see it on the page and mentally assent to its truth and the need for it in your life and turn around and yell at your kids. I know it's not just me, is it? That's really uncomfortable. You will sin. You will grieve the Holy Spirit. You will bring upon yourself temporal judgments, temporal consequences. Yet, and I like the Baptist faith and message here because they quote straight from Scripture. Yet, they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. They're looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, and they're saying, this is the hope that Christians have. You will sin. You will fall into sin. You will neglect reading your Bible. You will neglect praying, you will neglect coming to church, and all of these are grievous sins that you ought to repent from. And yet all true believers will endure to the end because they are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Can you imagine the impact these words would have had on these beleaguered Christians in the first century? Can you imagine having to meet in secret in the middle of the night? There are Christians even today who have to wind their way through streets in the middle of the night for hours to make sure no one is following them. Can you imagine the impact that these words from the Apostle Peter would have on them. Not only were they surrounded on all sides by paganism and gross immorality, but they were also being maligned and persecuted and marginalized. And Peter reminds them of their hope. A living hope. A hope that originates with God and finds its culmination with God. 
a hope that springs up from the steadfast love and mercy and faithfulness of the Father of Jesus Christ, but a hope which is also guarded and brought to completion by God. You don't have to imagine the impact it would have on these Christians. These are words for you also. These are not just general ideas for Christians in persecuted places around the globe. These are words for you. Your persecution might not be as intense yet as that facing these brothers and sisters in the first century. And yet the same temptations face us, conform to society in an attempt to relieve the cultural pressure. Just give in. Just go along with the unbelievers. Laugh at their jokes. Watch the same things that they watch. Don't stand out. Because if you do, the, they're going to turn their sights on you. Or you may be faced with the temptation to hide, to disengage from culture entirely. Peter's exhortation is for us to boldly go to this lost world with the gospel. And we can do that because we have a living hope. We have a living hope. And it's hard. It's hard. In your bulletin this morning, you received a little booklet. It's about Senate Bill 13. If you've been paying attention here, uh, you know what Senate Bill 13 is. It's a bill of total abolition of abortion in Oklahoma. There's a senator who has introduced it to the Senate. He has gotten support. Christians across the state and other states have rallied to the Capitol. And then we found out Friday that the senator who is in charge of bringing it to committee said no. Senator McCourtney is going to let it die. And it's discouraging. SBC leadership, the leadership in the Baptist General Convention of Oklahoma, a resolution was made in November to call for the governing officials to adopt a bill of total abolition without compromise. And yet still the leadership in Oklahoma in the Southern Baptist Convention is working behind the scenes against the bill. And it's discouraging. There are massive issues in this denomination's convention at a national level. And it seems like no one at the top in leadership positions is listening, and it's discouraging. And yet we keep going on, and we keep fighting, and we keep persevering, because we have hope. It's not a hope in our elected officials. It's not a hope in the leadership of our denomination. It's not a hope that maybe if we can drum up enough Christians to rally at the Capitol that something might change. We go on, we persevere, we champion the gospel because praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That's how we go on in this world. That's how we continue persevering. That's the call that I would give to you. 
hope in Christ and engage this fallen world with the gospel. May God, who is the originator of our hope, go before us. And we are secure because we are guarded by God through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. May God be glorified in his church as we go forth with a living hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. May it be an encouragement to your people this morning. And though our, though outwardly we are wasting away, we are being renewed day by day by your grace. And so we don't lose heart. But we are renouncing underhanded ways. And we are proclaiming clearly and boldly without any kind of cunning or deceit the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are trusting that your spirit will go forth and that your word will go forth and that it will bear much fruit. May we be a people who are full of joy and full of hope, a certain living hope, because Christ has died. And Christ has been raised. And Christ is interceding for us even now. And Christ will come again. Praise be to our triune God. According to your great mercy, you caused us to be born again to a living hope. May the gospel go forth. May the nations be glad. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.